Hey there, friends. It's Phil, and this is episode eight of Grow It. So let's go back a bit. Let's go back in time. <laughs> so if we go back to the first time I ever aerated a lawn, and from memory, I think the first time I would have ever aerated a lawn would probably have been around about. 2006 and um i didn't really understand i didn't really understand what was going to be the result of putting holes in the ground because at the time that's all i thought i was going to do i was going to run over a lawn with a hollow tine aerator not a spiker, a hollow tine aerator. So the difference between a spiker and a hollow tine aerator, they both aerate the lawn. But one obviously jabs holes in the ground and the other one pulls small kind of plugs out of the ground. I, th I think the plugs look more like, um, they look more like corks, kind of that sort of shape. Um, the, the aerator I was using at the time, uh, was called an Easy Core 205, and it had four four tines because that's what they're called called tines, and um, those tines were coring out little plugs uh, or little corks of soil around about 12 mil. So, so I went to this client that had asked me to aerate the lawn. I'd never aerated a lawn before. I never knew really what was going to be the result of aerating the lawn, but the client was determined to get me to aerate the lawn because he at the time said, um, it needs doing. <clears throat> now, for a little bit of a side, act, a side story on this one, actually, this was one of my customers who I had for, well, I, I, I could have kept forever if I hadn't left London and moved to Yorkshire, but his name was um mr waterfield uh i did eventually learn his first name tony but mr mr waterfield was uh i reckon when i met him about 80 and um he was fanatic fanatical about um about this lawn that he had and i think the rest of the garden he tended for or him and his wife tended for it in their 80s they were out there every day doing something and they were particularly good at growing rhubarb just around the side of the house in effect they grew so much rhubarb that i think every year i used to harvest half of it and they would never notice <laughs> uh, and they had some cracking apple trees as well but that, that's that's a side story but the thing is what mr waterfield and he was a very gracious man very well dressed very well presented and i still think he's around um what he knew was the lawn needed aerating it needed aerating because it was a really highly maintained lawn and we were running quite heavy cylinder mowers over it we didn't use our mowers by the way we used his mowers and he had a 28 inch um cylinder mower that was about 100 years old but in prime condition i mean prime condition anyway where am i going with this so like so we're there and it was me and um one of the guys that worked for me at the time, a guy called Paul. Um, and um, we ran this air racer over the lawn. Now, it was, from memory, I've got a feeling, and it's funny, with all of this lawn care stuff, all of my memories are kind of driven by, by nature because I get a feeling that I should be doing or starting to do some aeration conditions permitting, obviously. <clears throat> and let's say that um, Mr. Waterfield's lawn was in perfect condition, drained perfectly, needed the occasional clip like I talked about in the previous podcast, podcast seven. And, um, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we ran the aerator over and oh my God, I mean, this lawn was about 180 square meters in, in, in area and we ran the aerator over the top of it. And if the soil's in just the right condition, um, when you run 
a holotide aerator over the top of it, you pull out, I mean, tens of thousands of millions of cores. When the soil's a little bit damp, holotining doesn't work as well because it can't grip, can't grip the soil to pull the core out. Anyway, so we ran this aerator over the lawn and um, uh, I literally went, oh my God, it's going to take us the rest of our life to clean this up. But the good news is it didn't. It actually took probably the best part of an hour and a half. Um, the, the cores came up. They just laid on top of the lawn and we had some sort of super wide, um, sort of soft leaf rakes. Uh, like plastic leaf rakes that were brilliant at sweeping up tines. Now, one of the things um, that many, many people do with hollow tine aeration is they leave the cores on the surface um, because apparently we're told they break down. But look, the thing is, they do break down and they don't really cause any damage to the lawn, but it's just, it's just kind of lazy. You don't need to do it. It's just... You know, we, you know, we we were paid to do a job, do a job properly, and we cleaned up the tines. And then there was a huge, just a huge bag, huge bag of tines to take away. It was all paid for, and um, the job was done properly, really, really properly. Uh, and Mr. Woodfield, God bless him, fed us with egg sandwiches with a little bit of salt, which was delicious, and a cup of tea. Um, somewhere during that whole uh, that whole thing now we completed the task but we still the the, the 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 ironic thing about it is that once we'd done the task and completed it there was no evidence that we'd done it <laughs> which for the life of me obviously at the time being very inexperienced and this is like 12 years ago many lawns have been aerated since but i didn't really know what was going to be the result of the holotine aeration process being done in winter i really didn't know what the what the result was going to be but we did we did discover what the results would be come early spring now after we holotine the other thing that we did was we put down a kind of a an early season kind of feed which was much more um much more uh a kind of an iron based feed the iron the iron basically greens up lawn and kind of knocks out the moss a little bit but it was i can't remember what the mpk was um the mpk is basically potassium nitrogen nitrogen and phosphorus it's the chemical equation the sort of chemical formula for the product we were using at the time but all i remember is it was quite heavy in fe and I think it was really the, the benefit of putting that down is it hardens the grass up a little bit, um, protects it. So anyway, so we put this feed down um, and then we obviously said, Tony, we'll be back at the start of the cutting season. And the cutting season, obviously, in, in sort of South England can be 12 months a year. But we came back probably about four weeks later. And what we saw was the color of the lawn was just so incredibly consistent it was an incredibly deep deep and solid green it hadn't really grown an awful lot but the other thing that was really really obvious and if we listen to podcast seven we talked about my new lawn and it's a lawn of two halves and i have a plan for the two halves but what we what we discovered when we came back and did that first cut was the whole lawn area, and it was a big old lawn with many different aspects and trees and whatever else, but the whole lawn was growing or preparing itself to grow at the same rate. There's something about that. There is something about that. Now, when we ran the, we ran a lightweight mower over the top of it just to give it a clip, that first, first visit. But when we clipped it, it was obvious that the early season spring growth was coming and the growth rate was just consistent. It was really consistent across the whole of the lawn. And when we look back on that first cut, it looked perfect. 
absolutely perfect. Now, the moral of the story is trust the process. Trust Tony. Trust Mr. Waterfield. Trust egg sandwiches. But the moral of the story is that the process we carried out, which was simply a process of maintaining the root zone, the process we carried out had a significant impact on the start of the season. Now, what that meant was the start of the season, say spring, everything was growing as it should be. So therefore the lawn only got better into the main season. So we weren't starting late when the lawn was meant to look great. We did all of the grubby work before the lawn really got going. And by the time we got to spring, it was just looking perfect. Now, when you start the season with a perfect lawn, you start the season with a perfectly happy customer and you have a perfectly happy fill and you have a perfectly happy business, which is fantastic. And then people tell people, don't they? So the, that process kind of then did its thing. Really? Tony would say to people, yes, my lawn's perfect and beautiful and it's being carried out by these guys. All of the neighbours knew that we were there anyway because they could see, one, us turning up in the van, two, they could see us using certain specific equipment and they knew, therefore, because we came back year after year after year after year after year, that we must know what we're doing and getting really good results. And the answer was, the answer to that is, yes, we were. Anyway, look, um, so if you've got a lawn, and a garden and you want to make it look better and this is a year 2021 is definitely a year to get fanatical about your lawn is you have to trust the process trust the process and carry out the tasks and do what needs to be done when it should be done for the lawn not for when it should be done for you but when it should be done for the lawn and the conclusion is you will have a spectacular lawn mid-spring into the main season and also with the holotine aeration, the lawn is so much easier to maintain when it gets a bit stressed out, when uh, when it gets warm and dry. Anyway, but that's a, that's that summer season stuff is a conversation for another day. Anyway, look, I'm Phil. I'm wittering on. It's episode eight. Thank you for listening. If you've just dropped into this, yes, there will be more of my wittering stories to be shared. Um, Subscribe, tell a friend, share. That would be awesome. But remember, if you get a chance, just grow it.